Hello and welcome to another lesson on soundproofing. Today is a video, a reaction video again. I've done two of these now. And uh, this one is from Acoustic Fields with Dennis Folley. Some of you may have seen um, his videos if you're going down this path. Uh, I like Dennis actually. I mean, he has got some very interesting ideas when it comes to acoustics and sound isolation. And this video in particular, I found to be very provocative, which is good. You know, on YouTube, you know, we all try to make these videos that kind of get people's attention. Um, and especially in the world of acoustics, uh, this idea of the half truth and the double wall system uh, is really fascinating to me. So I'm going to go through what his argument and try to see where I can pick it apart, see where I agree with him and maybe see where maybe not necessarily disagree with him. But I think that there's more to the story that is important for for viewers to understand, which is why I wanted to make this video in the first place, because I think his short video kind of just flies right through a lot of stuff and there could be more to talk about there. So anyways, before we jump in, if you're going down this journey, I have a free resource for you. It's my free soundproofing workshop. I have nothing really to sell you. Honestly, the way I make my living is by doing high-end client projects. So I teach all of you who want to do it DIY. Uh, there's nothing, nothing there, you know? So, um, that's kind of what I do. And, uh, this, this is a 45 minute in-depth complete description of pretty much how I design and look at studios. So if you're interested in going down that path yourself, definitely check it out. Uh, it's super helpful. You can check it out at soundproofyourstudio.com slash workshop. That's soundproofyourstudio.com slash workshop. All right, let's jump into this reaction video. Enough, enough talking here. Here we go. I'm going to talk about a half truth. And this industry of acoustics is full of half truths. Um, exaggeration, hyperbole, all the nonsense human beings. Kind of I love this stuff. And let's just focus on the science. So right off the bat, I mean, this is classic Dennis, man. I, I just love this stuff. It's good. And 18 years of phone calls with this double wall half truth. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about it. I probably get five, 10 calls a week from people that have used this double wall uh, option uh, to reduce noise transmission. So we're gonna examine step-by-step step each part of it so you get a feel for why it doesn't work and why it works at certain frequencies and not others. So we all know what it is. It's two by fours with two two by four walls with an airspace. Now. All right, so he kind of goes over this quick. Two two by fours walls with an airspace. Yes, that's true. Um, you definitely need two layers of drywall on either side, no drywall on the inside. He doesn't really talk about that. And honestly, you can add three layers, four layers. You could not use drywall. You could use, um, cement board. You could use lead. You could use mass loaded vinyl. You can use whatever you want on either side of those walls. Uh, and that's where this argument gets a little crazy is we traditionally use two layers of drywall just because it's affordable. I mean, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. Like a lot of us out there, we don't have the type of money Dennis wants us to spend on getting great acoustics. And I, I agree with you. You know, the best option, the pros, they don't do this double wall thing. They do two layers of concrete block filled with sand or, you know, like it's massive. It, it literally is mass that you're using. Uh, so we'll get more into that here in a second. In airspace, I've seen anywhere in the literature from one inch to six inch, there's no you know, set distance on that, which tells me nobody knows what they're doing. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing that I'm learning about acoustics is the laboratories that test all this stuff, they only go down to 125 hertz. All of the, uh, you know, regulated government requirements make these labs so that they only go down to 125 hertz. And a lot of it is done for testing on voice and to impose regulations for noise control in apartments and residential and commercial buildings, not recording studios. And this is where Dennis and I agree. There is no consistency in anything when it comes to recording studio design, which is why it's almost this black art because the designers, the studio designers mostly are using experience. 
Um, in Dennis's case, he's using, I think he has like a warehouse where he tests a lot of this stuff. I don't know how he does it, but it's, it's super proprietary to him. He doesn't give away his secrets. Um, he, he tells you about it, but he kind of always, you have to pay him if you want to get his designs and things like that. So he's definitely doing some interesting stuff. It's just, all behind a curtain as well so for me i'm the opposite i like to obviously share everything with you guys if there's anything i do i pretty much share it everything i've learned is already out there anyway so uh, i have nothing to hide and nothing to sell um so i'm looking at this from a different perspective and i think you know here's the here's the basic idea here's the the key thing to understand and i'm going to make another video on this soundproofing is is actually somewhat simple from a physical theoretical standpoint you have what's called the mass spring mass. And when we look at this video here, we have the mass, or sorry, the mass, yes, the mass, the drywall really, the stud frame is irrelevant. The stud frame is structural. The mass is the two layers of drywall. And then we have the air gap, which is our spring. And remember the spring is not just this one inch air gap here. The spring actually goes from the inside of the drywall all the way to the inside of the drywall on the other side. Remember the two by fours are irrelevant. They're just structural. And then over here, you know, mass again. So we have mass, spring, mass. The spring can be anything. Air is a great spring because this is really important. There, you can, two things will increase the amount of isolation you get, the amount of soundproofing you get. The first is to increase the mass. If you increase mass on both sides of that mass, spring, mass system, your isolation is going to go up. If you decrease the stiffness of the spring, if your string, if your spring is less rigid, you will also increase the isolation in your system. Now, if we add, just to make things complicated, if we add insulation, fiberglass insulation, mineral, mineral wool insulation, cotton, felt, whatever you want to, you know, usually it's insulation because it's affordable, cheaper, and it's a natural building supply, that creates a drag on the air in there and the sound particles go through the little fibers of the insulation and they turn into heat. And that also reduces sound isolation a little bit, not a ton. This is why you can't just fill your walls with rock wool and say, oh, it's soundproof. So that's the system. And if you understand that, you understand everything. You can start to debunk all this craziness that you see on the internet. So when he talks about this airspace of one to six inches, if we increase the airspace, we're increasing the springy, we're reducing the rigidity of the spring because the air is getting longer. Our spring is getting stretched out and air is already just a really floppy spring, right? It's air. So that's a that's why we use air. That's why we don't use something else. Now, Philip Newell talks about using uh, reconstituted polyurethane foam as a spring. Sure, you could use rock wool as a spring. We do it in our designs. You can float walls on rock wool. You can float floors on high density rock wool and mineral wool fibers because it's a spring. So this is really important to understand. There's no one to six inches. No one wants to give up six inches, but it sure will improve your soundproofing. One inch is the minimum because through mathematical formulas and through testing, you can see that that eight and a half inch air gap, which is what you get with 3.5, 3.5 uh, and the one, sorry, I take that back. 3.5, 3.5 and the one is going to be eight inches uh, air gap right there. Um, and that's what you get in that space. The one inch is just between the studs. Okay, let's keep moving here. Let's keep moving. There should be some consistency here. The data should support that. Yeah, the calls it'd be nice. Consistently from people are, it's great for vocals, stops the noise from voice, does nothing for the low end. That's because it can't. There's some truth there. Not full truth this is a half truth with dennis <laughs> yes okay so i have a studio where i have experience in this i have built a studio i did use green glue but i don't think green glue is super super necessary but i think the system of two layers of drywall two by fours air gap two layers of drywall again on the inside decoupling all the way around as much as possible airtight seals all the way around all this is important for the system to work it works it, it might not be like if you had a subwoofer and you were blasting it full volume in your home and then it went right through your wall and you were like, dang it, this didn't work. Well, it's like, yeah, that's not going to work. It'll stop voice. Yes, it's meant to stop voice. Hence the STC ratings, which are meant to stop voice and airborne noise from humans. Um, for low bass, yeah, you're probably going to need 
a little more isolation. And, and Dennis is right. It all depends on the situation you're in. There's no one like single magic silver bullet that will solve all your sound isolation needs. When I'm designing studios, I usually look at, are they playing drums? Like, what are they doing in the studio? And then I can start to think through different scenarios in my head. Um, they're kind of a blunt tool. Like it's not the most scientific tool. He's trying to say it is. And I think it, maybe he's figured it out to where it could be more scientific, but you know, really you're using experience and your, your knowledge to understand how much soundproofing you need and what's going to work and what's not. And the more studios I build, the more understanding I get that real in life understanding of like, okay, this works, this doesn't work. I like this about that. I didn't like that because once again, the STC ratings are only going down to 125 hertz. We don't really know what the low frequency response is off of all those lab tests. This is another half truth that the industry is full of. I mean, you hear it all the time. Oh, the double wall. And when people call me and they have a noise issue, their th first thinking is the double wall. What you have to realize is you're taking up a lot of space. Maybe what do you got? Three and a half, three and a half, seven plus the airspace. Let's say two inches. You're going to use nine inches of space. It's more than that. It's 10 and a half inches when you get that one and a quarter inch drywall on both sides of your wall. And if you start doing three, four layers of drywall, which, you know, sometimes people do, it takes up a ton of space. You can use mass loaded vinyl because it can weigh up to two pounds per square foot as another sheet in there and it also helps with damping um, and that will save you some space two pounds per square foot is roughly the same as five eighths inch drywall which is 2.4 pounds per square foot there we go to stop voice because it won't deal with low frequencies it's not designed to <sighs> it's not that it's not designed to deal with low frequencies it's all about mass and it's all about the spring right if we increase the spring and if we increase the distance of the spring and if we increase the mass on either side and i'll tell you mass is going to be a greater predictor of better sound isolation than just adding the spring so i don't like that dennis is saying this because it's not totally his this is a half truth the truth is that the more mass we add onto the system the better it will perform so for example if we have two concrete walls let's say they're the 16 by 8 16 inch by 8 inch cinder blocks that we have here in the united states and if we layer those up with mortar and we put sand inside of them sand weighs a freaking ton literally and we fill all that up you're going to have some really really heavy walls and if we leave them with a one inch air gap and we throw a bat of rigid fiberglass in there you're going to have a very good sound isolation system but then you have to do the same thing for your wall then you have to do the same thing for your door so it's like the other thing i don't like about this video is it's like he's just talking about like the wall and it's like we need to think about the whole if you're going for like maximum isolation, if you're trying to stop low base frequencies, you got to stop it at your window, your door, your um, ventilation system, all your HVAC ducts. It's got to stop that same amount of low frequency, um, ideally, to work fully. Not enough mass to deal with. Low uh, not enough mass. It's true. Low frequency is vibrational acoustics. And building a wall with an airspace isn't, it addresses the vibrational transmission, but it doesn't do it effectively. Okay, it was a technology developed years ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago. It still works. Applicable today. It is. We've advanced in materials, designs, and knowledge, okay? Uh, physics doesn't change. So, the problem with this structure won't stop energy below 125 hertz. And we can cause all the. Also, won't stop energy below 125 hertz not true of course it's going to stop energy below 125 hertz it just has a severe drop off like all structures that that try to stop low frequency waves if you look at any absorption coefficient chart for let's say your acoustic panels they'll be pretty good at 125 hertz almost 100 percent i know people don't like when i say 100 percent absorption but it's true almost 100 percent absorption at 125 hertz and then you get a severe drop off that's just the nature of physics low frequencies are extremely hard to absorb um, and in this case we want to reflect the low frequencies back as much as possible which is what a really heavy concrete block wall will do it is still absorbing and and reflecting sound back in your room thus creating sound isolation below 125 hertz it's not true that it won't stop any energy it's just not as effective the time verifying that people use it in their home theaters they give up nine inches of space eight inches whatever it is and they're not happy with the 
transmission of the low end to other rooms in the house or neighbors or office buildings. It's true. That happens. Especially when we got those low subwoofers. We can treat boys in three and a half inches. That's true too. Potentially, if it's really heavy. To stop boys, take nine inches. We do it three and a half. Because we understand vibration transmission. We know how to All right, this vibration transmission thing, I'm like, what does he mean by that? Like, <laughs> vibration transmission? I mean, it's all, all sound is vibration transmission. Stop it. And we'll, we'll show you a graphic at the end about that. So, the bottom line with this structure is it's too much space requirement and no performance. I mean, if you're going to give up nine inches of space, you should have full frequency range of treatment, right? You should be able to cover all frequencies at nine inches. Our carbon panel is 12 inches deep, starts at 40 hertz, goes to 6300. So that'll give you an idea of what you can do in 12 inches. But when we're dealing with voice and low frequency, we have to be more concerned with density and mass, okay? So we use what's called the sandwich technique. It's vibrational acoustics. Remember, what we're trying to do is take a big airborne energy wave that strikes the wall, and we're going to make it come back smaller on the other side. So we have to reduce the vibration of this energy so that less comes out on the other side. So that's what we're, our goal and objective is with vibrational acoustics. So our sandwich technique does more in less space. That's the key. You don't want to give up space. Our rooms are small to begin with, too small in most cases. They are too small in most cases. He's right about this. And, you know, Dennis, I hope Dennis sees my video and doesn't take offense. I really respect him. And I think that, you know, what he's doing is interesting. Like I said, it's totally off the cuff. It's not in the textbooks. You know, you got to pay him to know what you're getting. So I don't know. But, you know, some people say it's been great. So I'm not trying to, like, hate on him at all. I just want to make sure that people that watch this video kind of read between the lines and get a, a different perspective on it. Um, and so basically the small room thing is so true. We all start with rooms that are too small. Acoustically speaking, a small room, you know, is anywhere like around, a th gosh, even a thousand cubic feet. Um, you know, even my room, I think is considered small to mid-sized and I have a 20 foot by 14 foot by 11 foot ceiling height, you know, and it's still, a, that's a considered a big room in the small acoustic, in the home acoustic world. So, you know, we're always battling our rooms when we're in home studios. So that's just something to keep in mind. But we want to make sure that we get the job done. The nice thing about our sandwich technique is it's easy to integrate into a wood frame structure. You can see here in the graphic, Okay, so this is really where he like gives you the the information, a quick graphic. Um, and I find this really interesting. So, you know, I'm vinyl, could be mass load vinyl. Uh, Philip Newell calls these dead sheets. It could be rubber, anything, you know, it's really important. People get obsessed with mass load of vinyl, but there's so many materials out there that perform in the same exact way. Uh, but in this case, you know, it's it's a a limp member. Uh, that has a lot of mass, but also remains very elastic. And that's sort of what mass load of vinyl and dead sheets and all these things are. You know, a big old rubber roll of rubber, you know, if it weighs enough, will act in the same way. Um, it's like punching a punching bag and the punching bag will sway and then come back and rock back and forth. And it absorbs that energy by moving as well as having a ton of mass at the same time. And that's the best way to think of this. So the, the eighth inch vinyl will help with absorbing the sound. Then you have MDF, which is, you know, weighs a certain amount. Then eighth inch vinyl, then plywood, more MDF, vinyl. MDF, you know, and then I guess that's his entire wall system there. And that would be, there'd be a two by four or two by six or however wide this is, uh, on either side. And, and, you know, maybe it works. You could go and build this wall. Um, but I would be really curious to know what the cost is. And a lot of times really what comes down to why I think acoustic fields in general is really, his stuff is really, really expensive. If you've gone down, I've done his phone call with him. Um, you know, he was like, okay, it's going to cost you like 20 to $40,000 to like treat your room. And, um, you know, if you're doing isolation as well, you know, you're looking at like maybe 150, $200,000 in a small room to like really do everything properly 
And I think at the end of the day, that's where we differ is like, okay, I'm all about doing optimum acoustics and getting like the most amazing quality sound and blocking out all the low frequencies. Like if you give me, you know, half a million dollars, I can do it. I can create that system for you. Easy. I will give you an amazing sounding studio. But the trick lies in the fact that we are all in the home studio market. And I almost like this challenge, even though it's extremely difficult, is how do we make a high quality studio, let's say in the range of like $50,000 that addresses sound isolation and acoustics. And I think that's where, where we different. And like, you know, I, I encourage you guys, I didn't take the time to do this, but add up the cost of materials on here and see how much it is versus just two layers of five eighths inch drywall on a two by four stud. I mean, a lot of the reasons why this two by four system prevails is it's just affordable and it works enough. Like it gets you the results that you need and I think a lot of you, if you did the two by four wall that Dennis is like hating on with the two layers of drywall or three layers or four layers of drywall, you would be like, oh wait, this is actually what I wanted. Like this is the goal. And then if you actually go another layer, which I like to do, and I'm trying to design studios now where we take, so you have your acoustic or your isolation shell. And then I like to build an acoustic shell and the acoustic shell also helps with low end absorption and also therefore helps with sound isolation. So you got to think of this as this whole system. This single wall is not the only thing. Then you have your sound absorbing system, uh, inside the studio for acoustics that will in fact help a little bit with isolation. Different layers of materials. This is for a particular noise problem. That's why we have to measure all the noise always. Because every material in the sandwich is based on frequency and amplitude of the noise. Every material. So he's got this whole system. Um, he's very scientific. And this is where I think it's really cool what he's doing. I wish he would share it because I think it's fascinating. Um, where he's like, okay, I figured out like every little vibrational frequency in here. And, you know, based on this much noise in your room, I know that this will absorb this and blah, blah. And I'm like, that's really cool. Uh, you know, if, if that's all what he's figured out. Um, for me, I know general systems that I know work. And I have a lot of different tools that I use when I design studios. And they also work. So it's kind of like, you know, picking your system. Do you want this like super crazy scientific surgical approach um, that may cost you a ton? Or do you want something more like uh, just for the people? I don't know how to describe this. More like um, just general based off general construction techniques that won't cost you an arm and a leg. Um, and I know will work. The other thing I'll say about his system that's weird is there's really not any you still don't have a spring in there. He has a lot of mass and he's got a lot of damping, but there's no spring, which goes against really some very standard physics when it comes to sound isolation. Okay. And the way it's constructed is also a factor. If you have lower frequency noise here, then this first layer has to have a higher density than the rest of them. There's a whole science to vibrational acoustics. So that's why it's important to measure the noise first, because if you measure the noise, we're not going to waste materials and we're not going to waste space. And we're not going to waste labor. He's right on that. So I don't remember what this graphic was for, but it was one of our projects. We have a whole series of these sandwiches that were in a wood frame. So he's got a bunch we're of different brick, types. A bit different. We'll just add to that density, but. If it's a wood frame and you got a noise issue, this is the way to go. It takes up less space and performs better. So once again, you know, the double wall, it works for voice, but not for low frequency. It does still so work a little bit for low frequency. And the industry's full of it. And it confuses people. And I get that. I understand that. Drives me nuts, confuses people. So double wall, half truth. Stick with the sandwich technique. <laughs> Okay, stick with the sandwich technique. I don't know. You can try it. Let me know how it goes. Um, you know, it's so hard when I, I've watched a lot of Dennis Dennis's videos and I like them, but it's so hard at the end of the day to be like, okay, we got to like literally invest a ton of money and try these things to see if they work or you hire him so that, you know, you're left with these, this conundrum. Um, 
And I think that that's just part of acoustics. It's true. It, and it comes down to experience. Dennis has a lot of experience. I'm gaining experience every day, the more studios I build and the more I do this. Um, but I know from my clients, you know, and maybe for you too, the number one thing they say to me is they're like, Wilson, I want to keep my studio under this amount of money. And that's usually a, a big factor in this home studio world. Cause we don't need to spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the results we ultimately want. And I think that's where I'm coming in, differing from kind of these guys who have been doing it professionally since the 60s, 70s, and 80s, where they had millions of dollars to build these epic studios. I'm learning from them, but I'm noticing that this new school of thought is like, well, we need to, if you're doing this professionally, you need to do it on a certain budget because like you're not making as much money as people used to. I mean, I don't know. I've done music professionally my whole life. And there was never these fat checks. It was always small checks from a million different sources. So, you know, you, you, do, you need the best room you can get that functions, but not going overboard where you're super far in debt and you'll never make that money back. If you're doing it as a hobby, sure, you can do it to the nth degree if you have the money. And if you want to, that's awesome. And I, I think that's great. But at some point you might be like, okay, this hobby's gotten a bit ridiculous and was it really worth it? So, you know, He's right on a lot of things. I agree with Dennis on a lot of things in this video, but I still think that the, the what he's arguing against is not necessarily true. There's a half truth there that the mass spring mass system still works. It's just a matter of how much mass and how big and loose does that string get. Remember, that's the key to remember here. More mass on either side of the wall and the wider and looser, less rigid that spring is, the better your sound isolation will be. And there you go. All right. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. It's kind of fun. I like doing these reaction videos. I think it's fun to like pick apart people's arguments and, and agree and disagree and hopefully all in good fun. I, I never want to hurt anyone's feelings over this. If you are going down this journey and you're curious about my methods and the way I approach all this, you can go to soundproofyourstudio.com slash workshop. That's soundproofyourstudio.com slash workshop and sign up right away and learn all about uh, an entire build of a studio, like every little aspect that you need to think about, not just the wall. All right. I'll see you all next week with more information. Uh, I think next week I'll continue down the uh, professional control room video series that I'm doing. So that that came out today. I'm shooting this on a Monday. It'll, I'll do another video next Monday and, and I'll see you all later. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye. Mm -hmm.